on behalf of myself and the New York Film Academy, we thank you very much for spending some time with us. You bet. And uh, before I really start anything, the, okay. the reason that I'm sitting here today yes. is your fault. Okay. In, in 1974, I saw my very first episode of Happy Days, and I saw Fonzie, and I said, oh, I get it. I get it, but I didn't want to be an actor. I wanted to be Fonzie. So. so did I. <laughs> yeah. He was everybody that I wanted to be that I couldn't be. You'll notice I'm sitting at the edge of the chair, and you know why? Because I don't want my stomach to fall right over my belt. <laughs> I just thought you might want to know <laughs> that, you know, I like everybody. Okay, go ahead. So my, my first question is, yes. in the New York Film Academy curriculum that we teach, yes. We teach the long-term students acting. As yes. Far, if, if we have an acting student come here, we also teach them directing right. and vice versa yes. as well. If we have directing students, do you feel that that is going to be an advantage to them? In Without a, a doubt. Okay. I was an actor first. I didn't know that I was going to direct. Um, my directing career was very limited, but um, everything that I learned as an actor, I used as a director. Every time I was on the set, I watched everything. And you ask questions, and the crew, um, you know, will just be so happy to tell you why they're doing anything. Uh, but there are a lot of people who are great with the camera, who cannot talk to actors, who cannot get performances. When you study acting, even if you don't want to be an actor, you learn what it is, how difficult it is, to take the word and transform it into a living, walking, breathing um, human being. You then know the process and you can communicate so much better with your actors. What I also learned, am I, how am I doing? Oh, you're doing okay. great. <laughs> okay, I just, uh, what I also learned is talk in short sentences. Now, 70%, you might have heard this before, of, you, uh, of your work as a director is casting. So you will be very careful, and you will know, in the same way that you know when you meet the right boy or right girl, you get that feeling in your stomach, you will get that feeling in your stomach when the right actor walks in the door, or actress, and they just own the part. You'll know it. Do not go against your instinct. Do not go against your instinct. Your brain knows this much, as educated as you are. Your inner voice, your instinct knows everything. Uh, how am I doing? You're doing fantastic. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, I directed this movie. Now, let me ask you a question. You, did you, uh, now, and, and you have to be honest. Do you see the potential of a film director watching this movie? Anybody? Anybody see? Do you, do you see that I could do this job? Does it feel? Do you feel to you that I could do this job? Yeah? Okay. Well, this movie, I was, I was just saying that I was the darling of MGM when it existed. Uh, Alan Ladd Jr was the, uh, the guy who said yes to Star Wars at Fox, was the head of MGM at the time, and he cried. He loved this movie. Nobody uh, but him saw it. It just went like a rock to the bottom of the ocean. Um, and then I was asked to do another movie, Turner and Hooch. Tom Hanks. And it was, yes, Tom Hanks was in that. Uh, and bless him. And uh, I was, um, I read the script, and I thought, I don't get this. But Jeff Katzenberg called me. He found me in Barney's in New York. I'm walking down the aisle, and a security officer said, excuse me, Mr. Winkler, you have a phone call. Hello. I'm I, honest to God as I live and breathe. So I, it's my wife who can find me everywhere. <laughs> uh, and uh, she said, call Jeff Katzenberg. I called Jeff Katzenberg from Barney's. He said, I want you to direct Turner and Hooch for Disney. 
Jeff Katzenberg, Disney. My instinct says, I, this is not for me. I don't know how. I don't like this. Katzenberg, Disney. I went against my instinct. I prepared it for five and a half months. I was fired 13 days into shooting. I went home in a daze. I thought, this is it. My, I was, I, I think it was like last Tuesday I got over that. <laughs> <laughs> I think, in, in, and they asked me, I think, in the early 90s to direct that movie whenever the hell it came out. <laughs> Do not go against your instinct. I'm not kidding. If it's an apartment you're supposed to live in, somebody you're supposed to date, a movie you're going to direct, a person that walks in, the director of photography. Very important. The director of photography of this movie. How am I doing? You're doing fantastic. Okay. Is this interesting? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. The director of photography, we didn't have a lot of money making this movie. It was a low budget movie. And uh, so I, I looked at a lot of reels and I chose a man, Andy, Andy Dintenfoss, who had never directed a feature before. And he directed commercials and I acted in commercials and I thought, you know, they looked great. You have to get along with your director of photography and that it has to be a partnership beyond all partnerships. This man was an asshole. And I, I learned, I'm not kidding, oh my God, I'm not, I, it's hard for me to even say, I can't even say his name. But um, <laughs> it's true. You know the, the shot when uh, Alan, I think Alan King gave the best performance he ever did. Oh my God, he was great. Oh my God, he was great. Funny would tell stories like he was in the Catskills, but just great. And it was also the first day of shooting was the day the stock market crashed in 1988, mm -hmm. right? And let me tell you that even makeup could not color this man's face. He just lost a lot of money. Okay, so <laughs> the scene when he's walking at down Paramount by himself and the sun is coming up over the... When I asked for that to be shot, I looked, I, you know, you're first on the set as a director, I'm, and there he is with the director of photography, and I said, oh my God, the sun, it's orange, it's, be, it's bright orange, it's rising over the stage, well, let's shoot it, when are you going to use it? I don't know when I'm going to use it, but it's beautiful, let's get it, well, I don't know how you're going to fit it in the film, I don't know how it's going to fit in the film, but shoot it by the time the motherfucker shot it. <laughs> It was a pale white thing. <laughs> Next question. Uh, it's fantastic that you brought up the casting process. Yes. Um, I I've worked as a casting director for so many years, and I've worked with over 2,000 directors. You must not have my number. <laughs> I just, I'm, just, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. In that casting process, yes. casting directors are the very first conduit from paper to screen. Absolutely. So how important do you find that process, number one? And secondly, when you see an actor at an audition, are you also thinking about them for possible future projects? And do you have that kind of a memory? You know what? I always keep, um, uh, even if I don't use an actor, I keep their picture. Uh, because you never know mm -hmm. and because you want to use them but it's just not right for this film. The casting director, you, you, you also, you have to really depend on their taste. Mm -hmm. They have to know who's out there. They have to, they have to feel uh, the process as powerfully as anybody else on that, um, on that movie. Mm -hmm. Because they're bringing you and you're seeing these people and people are coming. And also, let me just say that it's really lovely to be lovely. You know, I don't know that a film is better because someone yelled at everybody. You know, I don't know that Michael Bay makes a better movie because he intimidates every human being to tears. I don't know if that's like a great method. 
Do you know? I'm not kidding. Uh, and I, I don't know. I don't think I ever met the man, but um, I heard. <laughs> <laughs> You can be lovely because there are actors that have come back to me that said, I'd rather be said no to by you just because you treated me like a human being. You know, there is no reason why you have to be anything other than that. Treat people the way you want to be treated. Did I answer the question? You certainly did. <laughs> Uh, I'm actually going to open this up. Do you think I'll ever be hired by Michael Bay? <laughs> well. <laughs> Not after tonight. <laughs> Who knows him? Who knows him? Of course, everybody. Thank okay, you. Okay, so Thank those you. that have questions, please feel free to raise your hands. We'll call on you one by one. Who's got a Shy question? Folks. Yes. Exactly. What is your name? Um, hello. Well, I have a name tag on. And I can really see it. <laughs> <laughs> My name's Natalie Willow. Hi, Natalie. I'm actually in the MFA Acting uh, for Film Program. Great. And... Okay, I was born with them, and I used to watch you on TV. Yeah. So you're known as this icon as yeah. a film. Yeah, right. So how was it to, when that ended for you, to break into... Okay, let me tell you, that. And I think that's a great question, and I'll tell you why. I wanted to be an actor since I was seven. I ate through brick in order to get my dream. I wanted, I wanted to do what I did. If you will it, it is not a dream. A phrase said first in 1946 uh, at the birth of Israel. But the fact of the matter is what I have realized over my life, if you will it, it is not a dream, is the deal. It is not just a beautiful um, uh, pin, you know, needle pointed pillow. If you know what you want and you never let it out of the forefront of your brain, you put one foot in front of the other, you train yourself the best you can, you prepare yourself the best you can for what it is you want to do, you will end up at your destination. I was told that I would never achieve. I was told that I was stupid. I was lazy. I was not living up to my potential. So I... When I got the Fonz and it grew into 10 years and I lived that extraordinary experience, I lived my dream. I willed it. I did not know what I wanted to do after. And I want to tell you, if you don't know what it is you want, it is painful. When you are rudderless, it is painful. You, your psyche hurts. And then you just have to take a moment and really decide. Tonight, when you leave this class, when you go home, decide what you want. Write it in red and put it up on your mirror that you brush your hair in front of every day. And that you walk toward with every action. You brush your teeth with what you want. You eat your breakfast with what you want. You don't take drugs with what you want. You stay healthy with what you want. I'm not kidding. If you don't know what you want, stop for a moment. Take a moment. Make that decision and you will be shocked how you will shoot like a rocket in that direction. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yes, sir. What is you? Steve, I'm also uh, in the acting uh, program we have here. Uh, one of the things that I was wondering about was the actual transition from a performer to going behind the scenes. Okay. All right. So I'm on the uh, Paramount lot. We're doing Happy Days. It's uh, toward the end. Uh, they're doing a show called Joni Loves Chachi, which didn't end up being the truth. They don't talk to each other till this day. <laughs> Joni Loves Chachi. They couldn't find a director for the 13th episode. I walked up to the producers. The producers were really um, uh, nervous, and they were trying to figure this out. And I said, hey, I'll do it. They went, okay. I went, I was just joking. I said, no, 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 okay. And that's how I became a director. I didn't know much about the camera because I'm very dyslexic, so I have no idea what that line is everybody talks about crossing. 
<laughs> I want to tell you, I, I have no idea. But there's always somebody who is great to help you do what you don't know. So you bring what you do know to the party. And slowly but surely, you listen. You listen to everybody. And you're the final word. You have to take responsibility for your choices as an actor, as a producer, as a director, as a writer. Because the fact of the matter is, if you listen to everybody else and you ultimately do what they're telling you and you go down, you're going to feel terrible forever. You're going to say, oh my God, I went against my instinct and it turned to mush. If you go down and you go down in your own flames, you can live with it, you dust yourself off. I see myself as that toy, you know, with sand at the bottom. You know, you punch it and it goes down and then it comes right back to center. You know that toy? That's who I am. So I fall down, dust myself up, and I move on. And then I got to be here with you tonight. You know what I mean? I've been fired in, in every kind of job. Uh, I always thought my life was over, and apparently it's not. Okay? All right, I'm going to mention the first time tonight, Royal Pains. Royal Pains, a new show that I do. It's on USA. Repeat after me, USA. <laughs> January 20th. January 20th. Royal Pains. Royal Pains. Now, here's your homework. <laughs> I need you to email every human being you know in America. Okay, I have no pride. <laughs> and I need you to tell them about USA, January 20th, Royal Pains. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Yes. Uh, my name's Alex Weber. I was just wondering, which do you prefer directing or acting? Well, you know, I did a lot of jobs. I was a producer there for a while, and then I was directing, and I was not a lot, and then I was acting, and I thought, oh my goodness, you know what? I might be um, dissipating my energy. I might be dissipating what I'm throwing out to the universe. So my favorite, because it's where I started and it's what I love, is acting. But it has taken me since now, I went to Emerson College and I studied theater. I went to Yale. I got a master's degree. I studied theater. I was in the repertory theater at Yale. I got, uh, you know, and then I did, uh, went to New York. It's taken me until recently to finally get to where I want to be as an actor, where there is very little distance between me and who I'm playing. That I'm, if you look at Heroes, which is an act, uh, a show that I did, a movie that I did in 1979, I think you will see me acting. If you watch Royal Pains on USA on January 20th, <laughs> I think I have gotten where I am just having a conversation with the people in my, in the scene, my acting partners. Yes. What is your name? Uh, my name is Yuri. Hi, Yuri. I've been a practice in Russia, and now I'm studying the director. And I want to ask you about, if you know, uh, Russian great teachers like Stanislavski. Yes. Uh, Mr. Chekhov. Yes. Uh, I want to ask you, uh, do you use the knowledge when you shot on where you play movies? Yes. Yes? And I'll, I'll tell you, well, because they were some of the great teachers of all time. And they always didn't, wasn't the basis of everything they said. Acting is not acting. Acting is reacting. Acting is just being. It takes a long time to just be, to trust when I did plays in college, I had two costumes for the same part because I sweat so much, because I was so nervous, because I wanted to be perfect that at, at the intermission, I had to change costumes. I now only have one costume. <laughs> 
and I, that, I, you know, it, it is a metaphor, but it is so true. There is no perfection. There is no right. There is no wrong. When you go into audition, you cannot be right. You can fill that time and space the way you imagine it and let the chips fall where they may. I'm so dyslexic, it was hard for me to read the script and act at the same time. I would improvise. The director or the producer said, excuse me, that's not the way it's written. I said, that's because I'm giving you the essence of the character. <laughs> But here it is. It works. It works. You go in and you be your imagination. You cannot know what they want because they don't know what they want. Am I right? You are very correct. When you walk in that room, they're not always sure what they want. Mm -hmm. So you tell them what they want. And if they don't want you, then you say, that's okay. I'm so happy to meet you. I'm going to go down the street and I'm going to work for them. And if I don't work for them, I'm going to go over there. I'm going to work for them. And that kind of energy is going to get you work. It's when you walk in and you are okay. That's who books the job every single time. It's never the person that's perfect. It's always the person that everybody can agree on. It's usually one that's okay. Couldn't agree with you more. What is your name? You know what? Here it is. It's hard. It was hard then. It's hard now. It's hard. So it's what it is. It is what it is. So if you're going to play the game, if you're going to do it, you play the cards that are dealt you. They need you. They need somebody. They're looking for somebody or you, they wouldn't have an audition. It doesn't matter. And here it is. I'm 65. It's hard for me. You are handsome and you got Garrison. Hi, I'm Garrison. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It's hard. I do, no, it, it, there's no definition. There's you in the room. That's where there is. That's all there is. And, it's, and how do you get in the room? How do you get in the room? I don't know. You figure that out. You don't stop until you get in the fucking room. Does that make sense? <laughs> I don't know where the profanity is coming from necessarily. I, I, w I swear to you, I was just at the symphony downtown where I was swept away by, you know, um, Strauss. And I, I don't know where this is. Yeah, sir. There, I don't know. I don't have an answer for that. There is a technique that is going to feel right. You are a sponge and you're going to soak up all the wet and then you're going to wring yourself out and the moisture that is left is what will work for you. Hmm. You're going to listen to everything. You're going to try everything and something is going to ring true for you. And that is the technique. You understand? But I would talk to Yuri because reading Stanislavski, you know, uh, is not a bad idea. It's not a bad idea. It worked then, it works now, it's good. What is your name? Hi, my name is Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Hi. Um, censorship. What was allowed, what were you allowed to get away with now? I mean, 
Oh, censorship is, is different now than it was when I first started in 1974. You know, you grow up with a set of rules and that set of rules um, stays with you for a while and you go, oh my God, I can say that? Oh my God, she's doing that? <laughs> but as an actor, you are a, um, um, a vessel. And your job is to fill yourself up with your vision, the writer's vision, the director's vision, and then churn it like a Cuisinart, and then whatever comes out, comes out, and if they say you can't say that, you try another way. If you can't do that, you try another way. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yes. What is your name? Yeah. Hi, Danielle. Hi, Danielle. When you're acting. Hi. Um, do you recall where you were and what you were doing when you found out that you got the part for Hamilton? Uh, what? Did, where was I and what was I doing? My parents were very, 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 very short German Jews. <laughs> 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 they had just called me to say. They were taking my sister and what's his name and me on a trip to Europe because they did not know how long they were going to be here. They did not know how long they were going to be around. That was 1973. Bless her soul, my mother died in 1998. But they didn't know how long they were going to be here. <laughs> what's his name was my sister's first husband, they never actually called him by his first name. And I was in my apartment on Laurel Avenue, just north of Greenblatt's Delicatessen. I had a tuna fish sandwich, some ambrosia salad, and a box of Amandine wine, red and white for visitors, <laughs> for guests. And I got a call from the producers and they said, would you like to play this character? And I said, look, when he takes his jacket off, who does he have to be cool for? There's got to be an emotional side to this guy. And they said, OK. And I said, OK. And then I called my parents and I said, I don't think I can come on this trip. My career is starting. I just got a, a, a small part on a, on a series in Hollywood. And my mother said, Oh, this is nice. Here, tell your father. <laughs> <laughs> when the show became popular and the Fonz took off, all of a sudden, my parents were lobbyists. They sat in the lobby of hotels in Miami. Yeah, where's the Fonz's parents? <laughs> I've met people all over the world who said, hey, I've got your parents' autograph. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, what is your name? Hi, my name's Andy. I'm an Emma Payne filmmaker. I just have to ask this. Are there any updates on your rest of the development? Well, I don't know. You know, Mitch said that he's writing it, but he's also doing Running Wild with uh, Will Arnett on Fox. Um, if that doesn't get picked up, the movie uh, will be done a lot quicker. Uh, if it does, it'd be pushed off a little bit. But uh, what an amazing thing. Because of Arrested Development, I am the only actor in the world who has jumped the shark twice. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sir. Hey, uh, my name is Cyrus. Hi, Cyrus. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. She's thrilled. <laughs> I was wondering, um, I, I figured this was pretty early into your directing career. Um, did you find that you had to earn the trust for your cast and crew? And um, what did you do to 
Okay, here it is. Did, did I earn my, the trust with the cast and the crew? Who you are, who you are, will earn the trust of the cast and the crew. There was a scene in um, a, a television movie that I made with Dolly Parton, her first television movie. And my daughter went to the same school as the head of NBC at the time, uh, Brandon Tartikoff, uh, who unfortunately passed away too early. But I knew that we were successful because as I got out of the car, he said, hey, good morning, Mr. 37 Chair. So I knew the movie did well because at that time there were only three networks and we got 37% of all the viewing audience. Of course, Happy Days got 50. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a moment in that movie when a detective is um, uh, trying to figure out where Dolly Parton went. Was she kidnapped? And she has some written songs on her bed. Nothing is disturbed. And he wants to take one. I said, he can't take one because that would be like stealing. So I turned to the crew and I said, okay, ladies and gentlemen, I have a problem. This is a great idea. The detective wants a souvenir, but he can't take anything. What? And then the boom man said she tore, she ripped one up and threw it in the garbage. And I said, well, there's your answer. You can take that one because she threw it away. So you never know where a great idea is going to come from. And if you love your crew, they will die for you. If you respect them and you say to them, if the, if the, um, the, uh, um, uh, the costume designer comes and says, so um, well, I was thinking of a teal. And, and, you know, if it doesn't go against your aesthetic grain, you say, oh, my God, what a brilliant idea. And you invest every one of that um, uh, of that crew with your trust and you will get it back. Ron Howard, we did Night Shift. Anybody see Night Shift? Oh, do you have a lot to catch up on? OK, <laughs> Rent Night Shift. It is Michael Keaton's first movie. Very funny, written by the guys who ran Happy Days for seven years, who then went on to write some of the great comedies. Um, and they are now uh, script doctors uh, at the top of the food chain. Uh, Babalu Mandel mm -hmm. and uh, Lowell Gans. Wow. Night Shift. Ron came to me and he said, hey, would you do me a favor? Would you play either role? I said, well, I've played the Fawn, so I'm going to play Richie. And so I chose the other role. And we then went looking for uh, this crazy character, and Michael Keaton came in the room. We, we auditioned every actor. Mickey Rourke uh, came in um, with a radio tied with a, a piece of rope around his neck. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, everybody was there. Michael walked in. You knew. He had it. It was his. He owned it. Ron was scared, and he said, oh, my God, I'm a kid. This is my first major motion picture. Are they going to listen to me? I'm telling you, I went up and I asked them a question. I said, Ron, can I do this? He said, wait a minute. Now he's running the film in his head. He's trying to fit what I've asked him into the big vision that he's got in his head. The entire crew, the entire cast. It was like an E.F. Hutton commercial where everybody just leans in and waits <laughs> for this guy to talk. Who he was, just the way he carried himself. He got everybody's respect. Answer your question? Okay. One quick segue on that. Yeah. Where do you think, um, obviously each person has to find their own fine line, but what do you feel the difference between narcissism and ego is? Because every actor must be a little bit narcissistic. They must have a little something there. So where do you find that fine line, especially coming from, from the eyes of a director? You know what I have to say? It's very important to also keep your own ego in check. Mm -hmm. Now I've got two egos going. I've got the ego of the director and the ego of the actor. Mm -hmm. So... The fact of the matter is, listening 
listening. I truly believe that the center of the relationship between you and the world is not your mind, it is not your heart, it is your ear. It is the way you hear what is being said to you. And I'm telling you, if you listen and the actor is telling you something, you can take a nugget out of all of the, the talk and you can say, ah, oh, that, that makes sense, let's try it. Would you please try it my way and then we will try it your way? And you'd be surprised what comes, you know? It's the, it's the fear of giving up your power of I can't let go, I can't give in. There is no power. Power is a mirage. Power is your personal strength. Power is that you feel comfortable. You've got an overall vision. If the thing, whatever it is, doesn't compromise your integrity, your vision, why not? You've got more than one take, right? Yes. What is your name? Carolina. What? Carolina. And but how did you pronounce it? Carolina. Well, I like that. <laughs> Where are you from? Brazil. From Brazil. Wow. Um, I'm just beginning an actress career. Yes. And did you always want to be an actress? Yes, I did. Okay, so you're just beginning to study. Yeah. Okay. Took a long time. That's okay. Yeah. There are, you know what, for every person, it is good to know, this beautiful Brazilian just asked me, <laughs> it is good to know what to do, it is good to know what not to do. Don't be rude. Everything else is up for grabs. I was told, you know, I brought with me from New York my portfolio, my, the pictures that I had of the plays that I did, and I had them in a little plastic album, and I didn't have a leather case, and I put them in a Ralph's brown paper bag. <laughs> and people said, you can't do that. I said, why not? I don't, why? You can't do that. You've got to present yourself. Well, the fact is that the brown paper bag became a topic of conversation. It opened the conversation. And I realized Everybody is going to tell you what not to do. Everybody is going to tell you what to do. I will go back to where I began. You know what to do. Listen to your, if your, your instinct is saying, wow, I shouldn't do that, don't. If it's saying, I really feel like I got to go for the gold here, I've got to try this, do it. What are you, you're going to get the part? You're not going to get the part. What do you have to lose? But don't let anybody tell you. They told Barbara Streisand she had to, you know, her, they'll never get hired with her nose. Go have a nose job, they said. She said, I don't think so. Sir, uh, what is your name? Nathan. Hi, Nathan. First, USA, January what? Oh, January 20. Okay. January 20. <laughs> it's called Royal Pains. <laughs> Um, you were mentioning that that goal, that thing you put on the mirror. What do you ever reach that goal? Did I you, did. You did. I did. I reached the goal in that I got to be the Fonz. I wanted to earn my living acting, and I did it in bigger than I ever imagined it. I got letters from 126 countries. Girls took their jewelry off and sent it to me in the mail. What, this is what I learned from my fan mail. Jewish girls do not send their jewelry through the mail. <laughs> I think it's like written in the Talmud. It's a law. But I lived it. And then I didn't know that I could produce. And my lawyer, Skip Brittenham III, said... 
you know what, you'll be, uh, I'm going to make you a company and uh, I'll put you with people who know what you don't. And we did MacGyver and we did sightings and we did so weird. And all of a sudden I thought because I was so dyslexic, I thought I was actually stupid that I couldn't produce, that that was like something other people did. If you took everything I produced and you put it end to end, I produced 19 years of series. And I thought, I can't do that. Here it is. This is the truth. You don't know what you can do unless you try it. You don't know what you've got inside you, what you can accomplish until you just put one foot in front of the other and go, hey, I think I can do this. I'm going to try it. I'm not kidding. I'm living proof. I was bad in math and science and English and reading and comprehension. And uh, in history, I was great at lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, somebody said when there was a lull in my acting career, who knew there would be a lull? In there? <laughs> Why don't you write books for kids about your learning challenges? And I went, because I'm stupid, because I'm lazy. My parents called me dumb dog, dumb hunt. I believed it. If you're going to be parents, you love that child, respect that child just because they breathe. You support that child. Okay, so I said, I can't write a book. That's stupid. I'm stupid. Walked away. Two years later, oh, whoa. Oh, so <laughs> same guy said, why don't you write books for kids about your dyslexia? This time I went, okay. What is your name? Hi, Stephanie. I have a statue, <laughs> and I really love the statue, except it's taller than I am. <laughs> In Milwaukee. Yes. Um, my question is, you studied film at, or theater, yeah. I studied theater. How was the acting is acting is acting. And the difference between the theater is you must fill the space and take everyone on the journey with you live. You have to bring it down and keep a lid on the volcano for the film. But the fact is that your work, your left hand page, your understanding of who you are before you walked in that room, why do you say what you're saying? What do you want from those people? What do other people say about you? What is the history of the time you're making the movie? Who's the president? What's the feel of the country? What's the color people are wearing? All the same. Sir. I have no preference. My preference is to work and fly fishing for trout. <laughs> I have pictures of my children, of my wife, our dogs, and the fish that I catch. <laughs> All right, who knew? Yeah, I'm so dyslexic, I can't take a picture, you know? So I go fly fishing in Montana, and it's beautiful, and so I get a camera, and I... But I can't turn any knobs, because I don't know what the hell they mean. I mean, there's one knob with a lot of minuses and then pluses, and I've never turned a knob in my life. On Father's Day, there's a book of the photographs that I took, fly fishing, coming out, called I Never Met an Idiot on the River. Who knew? <laughs> See what I mean? Didn't know. Okay, so let me just say this to you, because I got to go. First of all, I'm so happy I was in this room with you. I was where you were. You will be where I am. It's up to you. The distance between where you are now and where you want to go is all up to you. The line between the two is as thin as the, the thread you sew your button on with. You have the power. You are very powerful. Don't second guess your power. Don't think about right and wrong. 
Just do what you know is right. What you for yourself know is right. You are all great. You have a gift. You dig that gift out. You give it to the world. We are all the same. We are all the same. All the questions, no matter what the accent was in this room, all led to the same path, didn't it? We all are the same as living human beings. If you come from your center, from your humanity, and you throw it out there, it's going to touch other human beings. If you, pre if you pretend, if you try to be right, if you try to be what you think they want, you're going to be mush and you're going to land on your shoes. You're going to drip right off your body onto the rug and there'll be a stain to clean up. Does that make sense? I wish you the best of luck. I really do.